All right, welcome back for session number two. We're talking about reaching your world with the gospel, and you're investing in your life and in your ministry to the world. In the, the last session, the first session, we talked about and laid a biblical foundation of why every Christian is called to not only communicate and share the gospel with, with, with people around them, but also to make disciples. We're not just called to make converts, we're called to make followers of Jesus Christ. And so in that last session, we looked at the Great Commission, um, and we, we talked about how oftentimes as, as believers, we do everything except the last thing that Jesus told us to do. And uh, that can be because of different reasons, fear, uncertainty, condemnation, um, a wrong understanding of the gospel. We talked about what the great, what the gospel really is, that it's a good news message. And so today in the second session of Reaching Your World, I want to talk about motives for ministry. Um, and this is a, this is a big one and we're going to condense it into about 40 minutes, but I want to talk about some of the, the, the core and the key motives that, that should be our foundation and our motivation to reach out um, and help our world, to help people around us. What, what are those motives that create a foundation for reaching people around us with the gospel? So no, let's, let's, let's jump right in. And I want to address four key motives. I know there's, there's a lot more motivations we could talk about, um, but I want to deal with four core ones today. And the first one, and the very primary and priority, is gratitude. Gratitude. Everything we say, everything we do, all our ministry should be motivated, it should be fueled by gratitude. And what is gratitude? Gratitude. My uh, Gratitude, I see it as my grateful response to God's love towards me. Gratitude is my, my heartfelt or my grateful response to God's love toward me. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son. Unfortunately, when we think about John 3, 16, we just think about the not perishing part, but really, for God so loved the world that he gave. God was motivated and fueled by love when he sent Jesus. The heart of the gospel is love. And so everything we do as ministers of the gospel, you are a minister of the gospel. You are called to minister to people. Everything we do must be motivated and fueled by love. Um, 1 John 4, verse 13, verse 12 and verse 4, 13 um, John uses this interesting language. He says, no one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us, and his love has been perfected in us. Now, that word perfected in the original context and language, it, it means that some, it's something that has been fulfilled or brought to completion. The New Living Translation says it's uh, love that has been brought to the full expression. And so John says, no one has seen God at any time. God is invisible. You can't see God. But he says, if you love one another, you are showing that God abides in you and that his, been, his love has come to full expression. And the fourth chapter of 1 John, he takes us on this progression, starting in about verse 7. He says, he says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. So he takes us on this progression where he says, he says, God is love, talking about the nature and character of God above every other attribute of God's character, his righteousness, his holiness, his justice, um, you know, his, his all power, you know, he's all powerful, all knowing. Above all these attributes, it says that God is love. It's not just what he does, it's an expression of who he is. So everything about God is love. That's who he is. And that is the starting place um, and the motivation for 
everything we do. God is love. And I can't overemphasize this. If you don't grasp this concept of the love of God, that it is the nature of God to love, that even in the Old Testament, when we, we read a story and we don't understand it, or we look at different things that, that were commanded in the law, we it's easy to get this concept that God was angry under the Old Testament and that Jesus changed him in the new. And, and uh, you know, he had a frown, Jesus put a smile on his face. But that is so not the case. God is eternal, he is unchanging. Everything he has ever done for, uh, uh, for humanity, through the story of, of the human race, through the, through the whole Bible, everything about God has been motivated by love. So God is love. And John uses this word love perfected and he says that God is love and he says this is the way that love was manifested towards us God sent his son into the world that we might live through him and in verse 10 he says in this is love not our love for God but that he loved us and he sent his son to be a propitiation for our sins so the starting place to grasp love is is grasping God God being love and loving us he loves us not because we're lovable, but because it's his nature and character. And the Greek word for love is the word agape. And that's, that's a unique word that talks about um, a love that is based on value and worth of the, the heart of the one giving it, not the one receiving it. So it's God's unconditional love that doesn't have um, strings attached to it. That is the love that God loves us. And when we know that, when we experience that, when we believe it, what it does it is it affects our hearts. It changes our view and opinion first towards God, but then towards us. It changes the way we see God and we see ourselves. When you see yourselves as loved unconditionally by God, guess what? The overflow is going to be you're going to love and value people with that same love you feel for yourself. So it is, is a, it is a progression. This, this concept of love for perfected or love brought to its full expression, it's a love that's given by God. It's received because God is love, but if you don't receive his love, and that's what, that's what John talks about um, in verse 16 of, of chapter 4, he says, we have known and believed the love that God has for us. So you've got to know. And in scripture, know is not just an intellectual knowing. It's an, it's, it's an experiencing. So when you know, when you believe, when you trust, when you receive the love of God, then it begins to work in your heart, changes the way you see God, the way you see yourself, and ultimately it leads you to give love back to God by loving people. Now, how do you love God? How do you love someone that's invisible? I mean, you can't go give God a hug. You can't, you can tell him you love him, but he's invisible. The way we love God is by loving people. The way we serve God is by serving people. The way we help God and minister to God is, I believe, I mean, we can, we, we can pray and we pray and worship and we do, need to do that, but ultimately, the full expression of love is serving people. And the greatest way to serve people is to give them the good news, introduce them to Jesus Christ, and help them lead them, help lead them into a relationship where they they where the gospel becomes very real to them. So gratitude. Everything we do must be motivated by gratitude. You know, when I was a young evangelist. Um, I was very ambitious. I was very bold. I was, uh, um, I, I, I was, my words, you know, would cut. And I would read the stories of, of old evangelists of the past, people like Charles Finney and John Wesley. And, and I would try to, to imitate that boldness and almost harshness. And the, the piece that was missing was the love of God. It was grasping the true message of the gospel. And I, I remember coming back from a trip um, overseas, I'd spent several several months in the nation of New Zealand with my my wife, who was seven months pregnant, and um, and we we came back. and I remember I was I was in a a place in my life where I was really seeking to understand just yeah you know, just God, the gospel, miracles, healing. I I felt that there was something that was missing in my understanding of of the gospel, and so I was I was really 
seeking God's heart. My motive was right. I wanted to, to reach people, but I had a religious understanding of the gospel. And I'll never forget in one of those prayer times that I would have with the Lord every morning, um, he spoke to my heart something that actually offended me at first. And, and when he spoke, he, he said, son, you don't understand the gospel message. And I, I to this day, remember that to, to a degree, I felt a little bit hurt and offended because now, God, I'm an evangelist. I've given my life to, to reach people with the gospel. Um, but how many of you guys know that, uh, that God always knows better? And uh, so what I began to do is I submitted my understanding of the gospel message and evangelism and what I thought I was called to do and what I already thought um, through my youthful ambition that, that I knew. I began to submit these things to God and allow him to relay a foundation of the gospel. And at the very foundation of the gospel is the love of God. God is love. And therefore, at the very foundation, the core of ministry, we have to have this understanding that everything we are and everything we do must be fueled by love. If it's going to be God's way, it's got to be done in love. It's got to be fueled by love. You know, the Apostle Paul 2 Corinthians chapter 14, he said the love of Christ, the agape, the unconditional love of God compels me. It motivates me. The Apostle Paul was probably one of the most qualified of all the apostles. And as, as, as far as qualification goes, he knew the Old, the Old Testament scripture. He was a Pharisee. He had been trained. Um, but he said, all these things I count as done to know Christ. And then he said, it's the love of Christ that compels me. So Paul was motivated by love. I believe the only way he was able to get past the condemnation he must have felt for actually being a persecutor of the church was the love of God. He was motivated and fueled by love. Think of the, the, uh, the prophet Jonah. Now, this is a great example. The prophet Jonah is is just a it is it is a wild story from the Old Testament about this prophet that did that really broke out of the mold and you you remember the story, but God appears to Jonah and he says, Look, no, Jonah, go to the nation of Nineveh and prophesy against it." And the story tells us that Jonah actually got on a ship, and if you look on a map, he went out to sea. He went the opposite direction of what God told him to go, and a storm comes down and, the, and the, um, the fishermen that are on the boat begin to throw lots to find out where did this storm come from. And they find out that it was because they had this disobedient prophet on board. And, and so they take him and they, they bind him and they throw him into sea. He gets eaten by a fish, gets vomited out. And, uh, and then he finally ends up going um, to the city of Nineveh. And it says the first day he enters the city, and it was such a large city that history tells us it would take several days to walk across the city. Um, the walls of the city were so wide that they could have multiple chariots riding side by side on the walls of the city. But the first day Jonah enters the city, he begins to cry out against it, and he says, repent. And contrary to what he thought would happen, this city of Nineveh actually repents. It says from the king all the way down to the slave, they repented in sackcloth and ashes. They actually turned to the Lord, this pagan, evil, wicked city that could be compared to a place like uh, maybe New Orleans or, or San Francisco or a place where there's unusual evil and immorality. That was Nineveh times 10. Um, it was just a wicked place. And, and they repent. They turn back to God. But at the end of, of the, the book of Jonah, you have the prophet, and he's sitting under a tree, and the tree withers and dies, and he starts to have this pity party. And if you, if you, if you, if you read it in context, the reason he is offended is because of God's mercy. It's because God's grace. This prophet believed that this city deserved punishment. Now, did it? Absolutely. But he didn't get the heart of God. And so he was offended by the grace of God, the unconditional love of God. And let me tell you, it's the same today. Grace offends the religious person because they think we should get what we deserve. But let me tell you, if we get what we deserve, we all got hell. 
God's grace is it's for the best of us, it's for the worst of us, for everyone in, in between. So the prophet Jonah, man, he had he had the scripture. He know, knew the scripture. He knew he knew the old old covenant front to back. He uh, no, he was a prophet, so he had the calling from God. He had he was called by God to go. He was anointed. Now, this is going to flip your theology on its head. He was anointed by God. He had anointing upon his life because when he stepped foot in that city, he preached and people repented all the way from the king up. So he was anointed. But you know what he didn't have? He didn't have love. He had everything. He was called. He was anointed. He had the knowledge, but he didn't have love. And that was the thing he needed the most. That's what Paul said in 2 Corinthians. He said, at the end of all things, <laughs> there's going to be three great things that, that, that remain, faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love. Love trumps them all. Love will go further, it will give more, and it will sacrifice, and it won't even see itself as a sacrifice. Paul, the religious ter terrorist, he knew about God's mercy and love. You see, God's grace it is not the ability to to you know, to to slip out you know, to slip in sin. It's not. It doesn't make you slippery so that you can just live the way you want. God's grace is a worker. It's a laborer. It's a changer of hearts, and it will empower you to reach your world with the gospel. It will open doors that that you never thought would be uh, able to open. A number of years ago, we went to a, a city in India. And on the, one of the crusade days where we, you know, we go into these, these countries and nations in Asia and Africa and, uh, and we put up advertisement all over the city and we don't advertise that we have the best Christian artists or, or the, the greatest preachers. We advertise that Jesus is coming to do signs, wonders, and miracles. And so people come out with this hunger to receive from God. And, and we, were, we were doing one of these big uh, outreach campaign events in a city um, in India, small city. We always go to the remote areas. And one of the afternoons, we sent teams out to the villages. And one of our teams went to this village of the untouchable class. Now, in India, they still have a caste system. Now, a caste system is a system um, that you are born into, and there's no way to leave that system. You are born into it, you will die in it. And so the untouchables are one of the very lowest of these people groups, and they usually are the trash collectors in the city or, or other types of very low and, and, and uh, meaningless jobs. But the team went out to this village, and they, they prayed. They said, Lord, how do we reach them with the gospel. You know, these people are Hindu. They they have no grid for understanding the gospel. And they also are, they're untouchable people. They believe that the gods uh, created them this way and, uh, and there's no way to get out of that. And they felt the Lord said, you know, go in with love, humility, and wash their feet. And so they went into the, the, the square of this little village and they, they brought and they started a conversation with one of the older women there and they brought her actually out into the open and they publicly washed her feet. And as the crowd gathered around to see what they were doing, they said, this is, this is God. This is, this is the God we believe in, the God of Jesus Christ. He comes to our level. He embraces our filth. And, and he comes before us and he loves us unconditionally and he restores us. And that woman became an example of, of God's love to the people. And as a result, they saw that whole village, when they preached the gospel, they saw the whole village respond and accept Jesus Christ. That is what love will do. That is what the gospel will do. That is what gratitude will do. Point number one is gratitude. We, everything we say, everything we do must be motivated by gratitude. You know, one of the people that has influenced my life the most is um, someone who's, who's gone now, but um, Dr. T.L. Osborne. And there was a, a young evangelist that came to him and, and said, uh, what's the key to ministry? Asked, asked TL, and it's, it's always good to glean from those that have gone farther and, and done more. He said, you know, what's the key to your successful ministry? And he, I'm, I'm sure this, this evan other evangelist was expecting something like you know, endurance and uh, something profound, you know, uh, 40 days of prayer and fasting or whatever it is. But 
he was so shocked by his response. TL said, ah, oh, this is the key to ministry. Just go and care for people. <laughs> I'm sure he expected something much more profound. Just go and care for people. I've taken that for myself. True ministry is always about just going and caring for people. And if you're not motivated by love and gratitude, you're going to be motivated by something else. And, uh, and the results aren't going to be pretty. Uh, I want to read Amos chapter 5. Yes, I do have an Old Testament in my Bible, and uh, and I read it. It's uh, the the whole Word of God is is good. We just got to read, understanding the Old Covenant from the New Covenant. Amos chapter five, verse twenty one. Um, God speaks these apparently harsh words, but He says, and He's speaking to the children of Israel who were religious. They they spoke the right things. They had the system, the religious system. He said, I hate, I despise your feast days. I do not savor your sacred assemblies. Though you offer me burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. Nor will I regard your fattened peace offerings. Take away from me the noise of your songs, for I will not hear the melody of your stringed instruments. But let justice run down like water and righteousness like a mighty stream. Even under the Old Covenant, God was not concerned with that form. And he says, I, I despise these feasts and offerings, even though God, they were required under the law. He said, I'm after your heart. I'm after justice and righteousness. I'm after the motivation. Now, Jesus ran into something very similar in, in Matthew chapter, um, chapter 9. In Matthew chapter 9, it says that as Jesus passed on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax office. Now, Matthew was a tax collector. And in, those, in that day and time, uh, Matthew was the scum of the earth. He was a traitor. He was a Jewish traitor that had sold himself for the sake of money to the Romans who were occupying the nation of Israel at that time. And so he was a traitor to his own people. He was stealing money from his own people and giving it to the Romans and then pocketing and becoming very rich and wealthy for himself. And it says that as Jesus passed on from there, he saw a man named Matthew. Now, interesting to me, it says he saw a man. He saw a man named Matthew. Jesus saw an individual. He saw a man with a name. He didn't see a sinner. He didn't see a tax collector. He didn't see this man who was, was, you know, was evil and a traitor. He saw a person. God sees people. He sees individuals. We reach the masses with the gospel, but God sees individuals. And we've got to grasp that heart to be motivated by love. We've got to get this concept that God sees. He doesn't see the sinner. He sees the person. He sees the potential. And through the gospel, he draws out the potential that he has put in every single person. And so Jesus sees this man sitting at the tax office. Jesus was able to separate this man's lifestyle from who he was uh, created in the image of God. And it says, he said, follow me. And Matthew you know, rises up and, and follows him. And it says that as Jesus sat at the table in Matthew's house, that many other tax collectors and sinners gathered around Jesus and his disciple. And when the Pharisees saw it, they said to his disciple, why does, or his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? Now, what did I say before? I said that grace will offend the religious person. The Pharisees, the Sadducees, the teachers of the law, the, the, the religious leaders of Jesus' day, they were offended that Jesus actually ate with tax collectors and sinners. Now, eating with them meant that he accepted them, that he counted them as his friends. In those days, you wouldn't just meet up with a stranger to have a meal with. You would, if, if you met someone over a meal, it means you you, you considered them your friends. So Jesus was what? He was a friend of sinners. But this is what he says. The Pharisees say, why is your teacher eating with tax collectors and sinners? And when Jesus hears it, he says to them, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice because I did not come to call the righteous but sinners to repentance. 
Jesus says, and these, these are famous words, he says, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, it's the sick. He said to them, you're spending all your time focusing on those who are already well when I'm coming to find those that are sick and to help them. And then he says this, which, which caused these religious people to fall off their chairs. He said, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. Now, they were preaching that God required sacrifice. Even today, you know, we're not going to go out and, and slaughter a, a, a goat or a, or a you know, a cow, but we have our own sacrifices. And he says that God is after your heart. He desires mercy, not sacrifice. He is a heart God. He wants to connect with your heart. And he's come to call sinners, the lost, the broken, those that have made mistakes, which we all have, to repentance. Now, repentance is, if we lose our religious concept, it just boils down to having a change of mind, a change of belief, that will lead you to a change of lifestyle. But unfortunately, in religion, we make it just about the change of lifestyle without a change of what we believe and what we think. And, and that that's, uh, just causes you to go right back to the way you were. If you don't change first your beliefs, the beliefs of your heart, then you won't truly change your lifestyle. So Jesus came to cause call sinners to have a change of the way they see God the way they see themselves. And Jesus said that is going to be done through mercy, not through religious sacrifice. God is a heart God. God is after your heart. Point number one, motivation. Everything we do must be motivated by gratitude, by love. All our ministry must be an overflow of God's love working in our heart. Love perfected is love received from God that causes us to reach out to those around us. So point number one, gratitude. Point number two, and if you don't properly grasp the first, the first motivation of gratitude and love, you, you'll twist this second point. The second point is obedience. Now, when motivated by love, obedience is an incredible thing. Now, um, the synonym with, with faith in the New Testament, and, and one of the words that, that, that describes what faith is, is obedience. They are an interchangeable word. If you have faith, you will obey. But the thing is, is just because you obey doesn't mean you're doing it in faith and love. There are a lot of Christians that obey God out of fear uh, maybe out of obligation, maybe maybe out of the sense of debt. I owe you God because you saved me, and so I'm going to do this. But it's not motivated by love. And, and, and you might be able to relate to this, and I could for many years. A lot of what I did early on in our ministry, we had great success. We, we were reaching people all over the world. We were cutting edge on evangelism. But so much of what, what I did was motivated by by obligation and um, instead of by, by love. Now, I loved what I did, but I wasn't being motivated by the love of God. So you've got to understand, when we, talk about, when we talk about obedience, our obedience to God, it's got to be fueled by God's love. It's got to be fueled with pure motivation. Jesus said it like this. He said, I only do what I see my father doing. I believe that's in John chapter 5. I only do what I see my father doing. And so everything that Jesus did, he first got his father's view and, and opinion and perspective, and then he did it. So when Jesus healed the sick, it was because he was seeing his father in his heart doing those things. When he reached out and, and restored broken and hurting people, he was doing, he was, he was obeying because he saw his father doing it. He was motivated by love. In John chapter 4, it says that Jesus had to go through Samaria. And so, and you know the story where Jesus goes and he meets the woman at the well in, in Samaria. And as we mentioned in the first session, the Samaritans were overlooked. They were rejected. They were considered unclean. And so when it says that Jesus had to go to Samaria, if you look on a map, Jesus actually had to go out of the way to go to Samaria. So Jesus, he was obedient to his father. He was led by 
his father by the spirit, but he was motivated by love. And so everything he did was an act of obedient love to his father. And I believe the same, the same thing must be for us. We must be motivated um, by, by God's love to obey, to obey the father. In Luke chapter 19, there's the story of Zacchaeus. Now, I, I, hope, I hope you're taking good notes because there's going to be a test after the second session. Um, in Luke chapter 19, we get the story of Zacchaeus. And it, it says that Zacchaeus, again, was a tax collector and an outcast and a traitor. And, and Jesus comes into his town and he hears about Jesus. And the only problem with him, him is he's a short man and he's also rejected. <laughs> he's the type of guy that goes into a crowd and he gets kicked out. He gets booted out. He's the type of guy that goes into a restaurant and he gets asked to leave. And so what the Bible says is that he actually climbs up a sycamore tree because he wanted to get a view of this man Jesus and I'm sure he'd heard the rumors that Jesus was nothing like the Pharisees and the Sadducees that he ate with tax collectors and sinners he'd probably even heard the rumor that one of Jesus's apostles his followers was an ex tax collector and so I'm, I'm sure that that he was curious and so he climbs up this sycamore tree now what's significant about a sycamore tree now a sycamore tree was a type of a fig tree. If you look that up in your Strong's Greek Dictionary, it was a fig tree. Now, what's significant about a fig tree? You go back to Genesis chapter 3. When Adam and Eve sinned, what did they do? Well, they sewed fig leaves together and they tried to cover their nakedness. What does that speak of? That speaks of dead religion. Us trying to cover our nakedness without coming to God. That's dead religion. That's works righteousness. Um, that's what the whole world and even much of the Christian religion is, is set in. So he climbs up this sycamore tree, which, which I, I, I believe represented dead religion. What does Jesus do? He says, Zacchaeus, he walks past there and he comes to stop right underneath that tree. And he says, Zacchaeus, come out of that tree. Come off your high horse. Come out of your dead religion. Stop trying to cover up your nakedness. Stop kind of trying to, to cover your shame. I'm going to your house today. I'm going to go eat with you. I want to be your friend. Takes him to his house. They enjoy a meal together. Now, what fascinates me is that as far as we know, Jesus really didn't even have to communicate he didn't teach. He wasn't preaching at Zacchaeus. But Zacchaeus gets up from the meal and he says, Lord, I am going to give back fourfold everything that I have stolen. And then he takes it a step farther and he says, and I'm going to give half of what I own to the poor. Now, under the Old Testament law, if you were a thief, you would have to restore back fourfold. So he said, I am going to do what the law demands of me. But the law said nothing about giving half of your half of your goods to the poor. He said, I am going to go beyond the law. I'm going to give half of my, my goods to those that are poor and hurting. You see, that is what the love of God does. It causes true obedience. Obedience to God that goes above and beyond what the law might demand of us where it actually changes our hearts. So obedience, 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 obedience. Jesus said in Matthew 19, verse 10, he said that the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. If you are following in the footsteps of Jesus Christ, if you are a disciple, if he is your Lord, then you are also going to begin to have a desire to seek and to save the lost. It might just be, it might start slowly. Now, I am, I am a firm believer that guilt and, and manipulation will not motivate true outreach and evangelism. It has to come from the heart. It has to be motivated from that place of love. But when you truly grasp the, the purpose of Jesus Christ to seek and to save the lost, you're going to begin to see things different. You're going to become um, aware of that person at the grocery store when you're checking in, that person that looks like they're just having a hard day and need to be to need to be encouraged. You're going to become aware because you're following in the footsteps. You're becoming obedient. Yes, it's motivated by love. It's motivated by gratitude. 
but it's obedience. You know, the, the, the statistics tell us that there is over seven, I believe, seven point billion people on planet Earth. There is nine mil, or nine nine thousand eight hundred and five people groups in the world today, and an estimated forty percent are considered unreached or untouched by the gospel of Jesus Christ. We need to take the gospel to those that have never heard. We have a responsibility to take God's love to people, but it's got to be motivated by love. It's got to be obedience. So point number two is obedience. Point number three is concern. Uh, Romans chapter one, verse 16, it says, the gospel is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. Now, when we think about being concerned for people, being concerned from, for the lost, it's, it's, it's sometimes tempting to just think that they're a person that, or, or, or an object that needs to be saved versus someone that has incredible value and worth that God paid an incredible price for and that we get the, the, um, the responsibility and the privilege of introducing them to Jesus. But the truth is, and we cannot, we are a ministry that emphasizes the grace and unconditional love of Jesus Christ. We believe that God saves us for an abundant life here and now. We believe in the promises of God. But we can't forget that to die without Jesus Christ, that is an, an eternal mistake. That there are no second chances. The, the Bible says that it is appointed for man to die once and after that to face the judgment. Um, I am not a universalist. I do not believe that that everyone is saved or will be saved. We need to share the gospel with people because what we do with Jesus Christ in this life determines where we spend eternity. Heaven and hell, I don't believe they're the, they're the core of the gospel, but they are, they, are, they are true, they are very real, and we need to communicate that. Eternal life is a reality. Um, in one of our, our uh, Asian Indian crusades, I'll never forget, we had just completed um, a, a three-night event out in this tribal area. It was you know, way out in the villages, and we would actually drive out there every day, and there was nowhere to stay, so we would drive back in every night to the small town where, where our hotel was. And we just completed uh, the third night of this event, and, and it was about 98% Hindu. It was a strong Hindu area, very few Christians, a few Muslims in the area. And uh, we had seen just thousands of people come to Jesus Christ, miracles of healing, demonstrating Jesus. And shortly after, about two minutes after we left the, the event grounds where the stage was and the sound, we were driving through these fields, and it was, it was very dark, and we came across what at first we thought was just a dead animal. And when we got closer, we realized that there was a man um, who had been hit. On, he had his motorcycle and he was hit. And as far as we could tell, he was dead and just, and just alone out there in, in this field. And um, we wanted to get out. We wanted to, personally, I wanted to see this man raised from the dead because Jesus said, you're going to raise the dead. And so I, I expect these things to happen. But uh, our, our guide and our translators wouldn't let us get out because the, the police were on their way and it could have been, it could have been a, a big mess. But I remember as we pulled out and continued driving back, there was just this soberness that began to set upon the team and myself in the van. And you know, we've, we've seen death happen and, uh, and we've seen accidents in other country. But this soberness came upon us that... What we were doing, preaching the gospel to the unreached, it, if, if you do away with all the blessings of, of Christianity and, and all the promises, just being saved from an, an eternity separate from God is, is, is enough to motivate us. So concern. It is not the reason we do everything. It is not our primary motivation. We're motivated by love. But when you really grasp the gospel, you begin to become concerned for people. Um, you want to introduce people to Jesus Christ. You want to make sure that if, uh, you know, if they, they do die, God forbid, if something terrible does happen, that they know where they're going. And it, you know, it's a shame that oftentimes it takes death to awaken people. Uh, quite a few years ago, my, my uncle was 
in, in the hospital dying of bone cancer. And he had cursed God his whole life. And he had rejected, to, rejected believing the gospel. He said that Christianity was just for idiots. Um, he was a very smart man, so he thought he didn't need God. But when you're on your deathbed, life becomes very, very real. And even, even for several days, my, my mother and my, my, my dad had been sharing the gospel with him, and he refused. He refused. He would listen, but then he would shut down. And it was, uh, he was getting worse and worse. And one of those days, he actually he passed out, and the nurses thought that, that, he, that he was dying. And shortly after that, several minutes later, he came to himself terrified. And uh, as far as they could tell, he had had a vision of hell. Now, I don't personally give a lot of time to these people that all they do is, uh, you know, go they, they go to hell every other day and have a vision. And <laughs> But it shook my uncle and it put him in a place to hear the gospel, to listen to the gospel. And my, my mom was able to share Jesus and lead him to the Lord. And shortly after that, he, 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 he went into eternity. And so, no, we, we need to allow the truth of the gospel. We need to have concern. We need, we need to allow that to sensitize our hearts to the people around us. But at the same time, our motivation must always be love. So gratitude, we talked about obedience, obedience from love. We talked about concern. Now, the last point I want to talk about is uh, responsibility. Now, the Bible says the harvest is so great, but workers are few. Uh, we have a responsibility to share Jesus Christ with our world. And this is the incredible thing about God, is that he could have sent angels, he could have sent an army to do what he's told you and me to do, and that is to communicate and represent him on the earth. Uh, people are saved by hearing the gospel. There is no other way. Oftentimes, I hear people quote St. Francis of Assisi, who, you know, he said these remarkable words. He said, preach the gospel at all times, and if necessary, use words. And there's a lot of truth to that. Our life should be a, a, a message of the love of God. Our lifestyle, it should represent who God is. But at the same time, that should never become an excuse for not sharing the gospel. We have a responsibility. I remember at one of our events here in America many years ago, we were going into high schools down in the southern part of America, and we would do school assemblies, and I would ride a skateboard. Yep, believe it or not, used to do that. And uh, and then we would invite the young people out to an evening event where we would perform and we would share the gospel. And through this, this way, we reached tens of thousands of um, unchurched young people all across America and the world. But at one of their, those events, there was a young man that ended up coming to Jesus, and one of our team members introduced him and, and prayed with him to accept the Lord. And he ended up joining our team and traveling with us for several years. Uh, but he, he told us after he came to the Lord, he said that he had been plan planning to set a bomb off at his high school. He was a military kid, and his uh, his parents had made him move every every couple years, and he had never been able to connect in the schools he attended. Uh, he, he struggled with self worth and self hatred, and he was constantly made fun of and mocked. And so he he thought to himself, "I'm going to build this bomb in my in my garage, and I'm going to set it off in my locker at school." And so he actually made this bomb. And when he met Jesus Christ, it so radically changed his life that he, he got rid of got rid of that and completely changed his life. The love of God changed his life, not only his, but saved who knows how many people whose lives could have been taken. So we, we do have a responsibility to share the gospel. Um, in New Zealand, many years ago, there was a, a young girl, uh, about 13 years old, who came to our event and accepted the Lord, and she came to me. And she said, thank you for coming to my city. And she said, if you had never come and told me about Jesus, I probably never would have believed in him. Paul said it like this. He said, how will they hear without a preacher? And how will they go if they're not sent? We have the incredible privilege and the incredible 
responsibility to take God's good news to a lost and hurting world. People are saved by hearing the gospel. There is no other way. Uh, we, we need to live it. We need to show it. We need to do the acts of love and charity. We believe in all these things, but we never need to let those things take the place of sharing God's good news with people. So for me, responsibility, this, this motive of responsibility, is not, it is not heavy. It is not, uh, it is not an obligation or a debt. It is something that's fueled by gratitude, my obedience, my concern, my sense of responsibility to the world comes out of this knowing where I was, knowing where I came from, knowing what took place in my life. And so that's, that's the last reason is what has Jesus done for you? How has your life been transformed by the gospel? Under the, in the Old Testament, you'll, you'll see that the, the, the people would constantly set up stones of remembrance. And, and what it was, it was a trigger that when they saw that stone or that tower or whatever it was, when they saw it, it would trigger a memory of what God had done in their life, the victory, where he had taken them from, how he had showed up and moved in their lives. It would trigger a memory and a sense of gratitude towards God. Now, we need to set up those stones of remembrance in our hearts where we remember where we came from, where we remember um, the price that was paid. Oftentimes, I will just sit back and remember where I was before I understood the gospel, before I knew Jesus, before I'd been born again, because I don't want to become so disattached from the needs of people around me. If you're not careful, you'll end up just living your life, going to church, reading your Bible, doing your prayers, and becoming disattached from lost and hurting and broken people around you. And you never, you never want to get to that place where you're not moved by love and compassion. So th this, this final motive, motivation for ministry is remembering what God has done in your life, how he's changed you, healed you, and brought you out. So friends, be blessed. This is session number two, our motivation. I hope you took good notes. We'll see you next time.